All right, welcome to part B of lecture 27. Let's take a look at bimetallism and the birth of the free silver movement in the United States. All right, so a few lectures back, we took a look at global money and banking in the 19th century. And if you recall, I noted how in Europe, beginning in Britain and then France and then Austria and, and Germany, Europe by the 1860s, by the late 1860s, has converged onto the gold standard so that European, the big predominant European powers are firmly fixed to gold in the 19th century. They still have some silver for small change, such as the shilling in Great Britain, uh, but for all intents and purposes, a gold currency. Outside of Europe, with a couple notable exceptions, Japan being one of them. Silver is the standard. So in Latin America, the Middle East, China, and of course, India. All right, so bimetallism, bimetallism. I've already introduced bimetallism at length. I'll point you to that other video if you haven't seen it. But in short, oh, <laughs> There he is, there he is. Thomas Gresham, Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law, that, you know, if you have one takeaway from bimetallism, it's, it's Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law presents the key problem with, with bimetallism. There he is, there he is. Gresham's Law, bad money chases out good money. Bad money chases out good money. Why is this related to bimetallism? Well, the market ratio between silver and gold constantly fluctuates. However, just, just as it does for any commodity, you know, sometimes silver goes up, sometimes gold goes up, sometimes silver goes down, sometimes gold go da goes down, it fluctuates. The price on the market. The problem with bimetallism is that under bimetallism, governments establish a fixed ratio between gold and silver. Therefore, oftentimes a discrepancy emerges between the legal ratio defined by the government in the actual market ratio, causing one metal to be overvalued and the other metal to be undervalued. The example I used in that lecture, let's say the market ratio is 13 to one, to buy one ounce of gold, you need 13 ounces of silver, but the legal ratio in a particular country is 12 to one. To buy an ounce of gold, you only need 12 ounces of silver. In this case, silver is overvalued. Silver is overvalued and gold is undervalued, meaning silver receives a higher price in this government than it receives in the marketplace and gold receives a lower price in this government than it receives in the marketplace. This causes silver to enter into a country, causes gold to leave the country. And that is Gresham's law, right? Um, the undervalued metal flee cir circulation, the overvalued metal or, or bad money dominates circulation, chases out the undervalued metal. All right, so the Coinage Act of 1792 is the initial uh, coinage le legislation passed by Congress after the Constitution was ratified. And Congress defined the U.S. dollar in terms of both silver and gold. U.S. dollar is defined as eh, just shy of an ounce of silver and, and quite a bit less in gold. There's the silver dollar. There's the gold eagle. Gold eagle, $10. This was a bimetallic dollar standard, and the ratio was 15 to 1. So according to the U.S. Congress, one ounce of gold was equal to 15 ounces of silver. This happened to correspond with the market ratio in 1792. Also, there were, there were other coins. Um, there's a dime, silver dime, uh, a copper penny. Okay, so there's other coins as well besides these, but the silver gold ratio 15 to 1. Well, that ratio changes. In the early part of the 19th century, there, are, there is increased silver production in Mexico. And so, 
supply and demand. When demand for all intents and purposes is, is constant, but supply goes up, the price or the value goes down because there's more supply than you saw in the increase in demand. The ratio in the US was 15 to one as defined in, in, 1892, in 1792. However, the market ratio by 1800 had already gone to 15 and a half to one. And by 1805, it's 15 and three quarters to one. Meaning silver in the marketplace has lost some value. However, silver in the US is still defined as 15 to one. Meaning silver was overvalued in the United States. And that's, you know, not the most severe overvaluation you've ever seen, but it's a, it's a big uh, difference, 15 and three quarters to 15. And so for the early decades in the 19th century, the, the, the period of, you know, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, John Quincy Adams in the 1820s, the early part of Andrew Jackson's administration, silver coin was the predominant coin in circulation. He saw some gold, but for the most part, silver dominated. And silver came into the U.S. and gold generally left the U.S. And, and some very astute tradesmen would bring silver into the United States, maybe from Mexico, buy gold very cheaply in in the United States and export that gold out of the country. Get it out of there. It doesn't... It doesn't earn a high enough price in the United States under this ratio. And so gold would be left out of the United States and then bought for more silver to be brought into the United States and so on. Also, before 1857, Spanish pieces of eight, the old, old piece of eight, was still legal, legal tender in the United States. And so you saw a lot of Spanish silver coins in circulation in the U.S. Maybe as much as one third of the coin in the U.S. was Spanish well andrew jackson says you know let's put the brakes on this and it's time to alter the ratio and so andrew jackson in con in conjunction with congress in 1834 changed the ratio to 16 and 1 and, and the way he did this was he debased um, or reduced the amount of gold in in the coinage so a gold dollar used to have 24.75 grains, and it was reduced to 23.2 grains of gold. The debase, the the reduction was just more than six percent. So about six percent reduction in the gold, in the coinage. This altered the ratio to 16 to one. Okay, well that was supposed to solve the issue. Now that's now we're right at the market the market level. We can have a bimetallic system again, not just silver. We can have gold and silver. Remember, Jackson's a hard money guy. He would like to have both. The problem, this is the, the, the recurring problem with bimetallism. One can understand the frustration with bimetallism. It's just, it's very difficult to, to get the right ratio and the government overcompensated, okay? Because at the time in 1834, the market ratio was 15.8. 15.8 to 1. And so silver goes from being quite overvalued and you know, it gotten pretty severe. 15.8 to 1 versus 15 to 1. That's a that's a pretty significant overvaluation of silver. It went from overvalued silver to a a slight overvaluation of gold. Okay? A slight overvaluation of gold. Government overcompensated. Still it's only about a 1 to 2% difference. Between the legal and the market, between the legal and the market ratio, so it's not a, a huge difference. Um, silver did not completely flee circulation as a result of this slight overvaluation of gold. Nonetheless, um, you know it's it 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 favors gold a little bit after 1834. Well, then in 1848, gold is discovered in California, discovery of gold in California. And through 1849, the so-called 49ers, just tens of thousands of adventurers poured into the valleys of California, searching frantically for, um, uh, uh, for gold in, in the valleys and the streams and the hills. 
and it's a big deal. Uh, uh, a fortunate few did strike it rich, and that was enough to, to encourage many people to come out. But for the majority of the gold rushers, it might have been better just staying off, staying back out east. But the, the promise of that, of, of doing well, you know, was enough to, to drive them out to California. So major gold discovery. What does that mean for gold-silver ratio? Well, it means the price of gold is going, going, to, uh, going to go down a little bit as gold production soared. 1848, discovery of gold in California. And then in the 1850s, there were gold discoveries in Russia and Alaska. So gold production is going through going through the roof. Look at the numbers here. This is pretty remarkable. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why Europe was persuaded to go to the gold standard because around this time period, gold production is skyrocketing. Um, gold production per year for about a, a good century was, was close to $13 million worth of gold. In the 1840s, that had gone up to almost $40 million of gold. And by the 1850s, worldwide, some $140 million of gold was produced every year, worldwide, all right? So uh, gold production is soaring. Again, anytime you have the supply going up, 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 the price is going to fall. Even as Europe adopts the gold standard, which increases demand for gold, price of gold falls <laughs> and so by 1855 the ratio is now 15.3 to 1 so ironically actually if the u.s had st stuck to the 15 to 1 ratio instead of changing it to 16 to 1 by the 1850s the u.s would have been you know uh closer to the market ratio than they were now at 16 to 1 again the headache of bimetallism uh, but now, what's the uh, uh, overvalue metal and what's the undervalue metal? Gold is now significantly overvalued in the United States. Significantly overvalued in the United States. It, because worldwide, if you have an ounce of gold, you just barely get 15 ounces of silver. But in the United States, if you have an ounce of gold, you could get 16 ounces of silver. Gold has a higher price in the US than elsewhere, and silver has a lower price in the US than elsewhere. So that's the situation on the eve of the Civil War. So to review, corresponds to the market in 1792 for the first three and a half decades of the 19th century, silver was overvalued. Between 1834 and 1848, gold was slightly overvalued, but not enough to, to cause silver dollars to, to, to leave circulation or to not be minted. But then in the 12 years preceding the Civil War, gold was significantly overvalued in the U.S. And so you have, this is a $1 gold piece from 1858. That, this one's from 1850. Um, <clears throat> There's a $10 piece, the Eagle, a $1 gold piece. And, and actually from 1848 to 1853, there was a bit of a coinage crisis in the United States because gold was just dominating, 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 and there wasn't enough small change. The silver was so undervalued, nobody wanted to, to take silver to the mint to make dollars or quarters or dimes. And so there was a, an extreme shortage of quarters in and dimes. And so the Congress responded in 1853 by debasing, devaluing the silver in the quarter and in the dime and in the half dime, which was an old coin back in those days. Uh, the quarter dime and half dime reduced the silver content in those coins by 7%, even while it, it kept the silver in the dollar, the $1 coin alone. It left that alone, but in the, in for, small change it reduced the amount of silver which allowed for for uh the production again of quarters dimes and half dimes and of course you had copper pennies and, and a copper half cent as well um but for all intents and purposes this is a gold a gold country because silver dollars are not being minted in the 1850s no really silver dollars are not minted in the united states from 
from the late 1840s onward. Uh, silver dollars are just, they're not being taken to the mint. They're, people aren't taking their silver to the mint any longer for to make dollars because dollars, silver dollars are so undervalued. All right. During the Civil War, we're on a fiat standard. I mean, there's no gold and no silver for all intents and purposes. It's hoarded and whatever. Um, the bank suspended specie payments and, and the U.S. was on a fiat currency. But the question was, what do we do with bimetallism when the war is over? Fiat standard during the Civil War. When the Civil War ends, gold is, the, the ratio is still 16 to 1, and that still is an overvalued gold coinage. And so we have, we have uh, you know, a combination of greenbacks, national banknotes, and, and gold coins. What to do about bimetallism? These are some post-Civil War coins. Newman's Mattesis will, will like this lecture if you're into coin collecting at all. There's some really cool coins here. This is a double eagle, a double eagle gold coin, which meant $20. This is an, a, an, a gold eagle, $10 gold coin, and a $1 gold coin, quite a, a, a small coin, $1 gold coin. Um, and then, because again of the Coinage Act of 1853, it allowed for, it reduced the silver in, in a small change. And so even though you don't have any silver dollars really at all minted in after the Civil War, um, you do have some quarter dollars, silver dime. And then uh, Congress created a, a new coin, the nickel, after 1866. And the nickel, a five cent piece, was at 75% copper and 25% nickel. So the Congress, they're trying to have small change here because it's it's gold. You're, this is a gold country after, uh, after the Civil War, just as it was in the 1850s. Here's some other coins, a three cent piece. These are copper, two, two cent, one cent piece. Yeah, we used to have two cent and three cent pieces in this country. <clears throat> All right, so still haven't solved the bimetallic issue. However, it seems like we have some of a de facto gold standard, okay, in the 1850s and in the years after the, the uh, Civil War. By 1872, Europe is fully on a gold monometallic standard, all right, except again for small change, kind of like the US. There was a big monetary conference in Paris in 1867, and the European countries got together and the gold standard, all about the gold standard. Meanwhile, by this point in time, the rest of the world, such as India, is on a silver standard. So there are many people in America who, who figure hey, the U.S. is on the same trajectory. We, like Europe, have adopted the gold standard, and, and that's where we are. The adoption of the gold standard in Europe had led to... Uh, less demand in Europe for silver, which is lowering the price of silver. So the demand for silver is going down in Europe. Tarnishing of silver's reputation. Then, around 1872, there were new silver discoveries in the American West, in particularly Nevada or Nevada. And big silver discoveries and, and if I'm not mistaken, Nevada is nicknamed the Silver State. Go out west, a lot of silver, silver interest. Major silver discovery in Nevada. Well, let's see. The demand for silver in Europe is going down because Europe's gone gold. And the supply of silver is about to shoot up. What does that mean for the price of silver? The price of silver is on the verge of completely collapsing. It hasn't yet, but it's on the verge as demand for silver is going down and the supply for silver is threatening to shoot up with all these new silver mines in the American West. Right now, the market ratio is still about 15 and a half to one, okay? 15 and a half to one. The US is still on a 16 to one ratio. That means gold is still overvalued a little bit in the United States. However, if something if the if the price of silver crashes, okay, because of this huge these huge discoveries in Nevada, because of lower demand, if the price of silver crashes, 
And let's say the market value goes to something like 21, 20 to 1, just hypothetical. Okay. If the market value becomes 20 to 1, then at 16 to 1, <laughs> gold is not going to be overvalued anymore in the United States. Quite the contrary. Silver at 16 to 1, at the market's 21, will be drastically, drastically overvalued in the United States. And what you'll see, if nothing changes, gold would just disappear from the U.S. because it would be so undervalued in the United States compared to silver. And, and the currency in the U.S. would just be dominated by silver. It would become a silver country. Uh, say goodbye to these coins, all right? You're not gonna see any more of these coins minted if the ratio in the United States is 16 to one and the market ratio meanwhile is like 20 to one or 25 to one, these coins aren't gonna be minted anymore and the, and the currency is gonna be dominated by silver dollars. And so Congress gets ahead of it things and passes a coinage act without much fanfare, actually it was a bit quiet the way it was passed in 1873, it was nicknamed by its opponents later the crime of 1873, this coinage act discontinued the minting of all silver dollars in the United States. No more minting of silver dollars. Here's it. This is one of the last silver dollars minted before this, this legislation. It's a silver dollar from 1872. Now, one of the reasons why it didn't receive much fanfare is that by 1873, silver dollars hadn't been minted in a long time anyway. This was pretty rare to see a silver dollar from 1872 because um, silver was so undervalued in, in this uh, previous period. So it was very undervalued. And so there are few people bringing silver to the mint to coin into silver dollars. Any silver that, you know, that was minted during this time period tend to be quarters, dimes, half dimes and such. Um, but, you know, if silver became overvalued, all of a sudden people are going to want to to mint these one dollar silver coins. And so Congress discontinues the minting of those silver dollars. And then the following year, fall, uh, in 1874, Congress followed up with another coinage act, which stipulated any remaining silver in circulation, silver dollars minted you know, years ago, or silver quarters, any silver coins at all that, that are still in circulation, no longer legal tender for any sum above $5. So if you owe like 50 bucks, you wouldn't be permitted, you're not allowed to pay that $50 debt with all this, you know, it's under, it's uh, overvalued silver, okay? So this is a big bill. Demonetizes, discontinues the minting of silver dollars and demonetizes the remaining silver. Um, now, it still allows the, the coinage of quarters and dimes and small change. Just no silver dollars. No more silver dollars allowed. Well, turns out that that bill was very timely because by 1874, the price of silver had indeed fallen and now it's 16 to 1. Now, that was the former ratio, 16 to 1. Um, so that wouldn't have been disastrous. But then by 1876... It's 18 to 1. Then throughout the 1880s, it continues to dip, 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 dip. And then by 1894, the ratio, the market ratio, the market ratio between silver and gold was 32 to 1. 32 to 1. This was a historic crash in the price of silver. And if the U.S., if this had not happened, the demonetize, the the demonetization of silver and the discontinuing of silver dollars, the the U.S. gold would have just absolutely left circulation in the U.S. and and at this ratio, it would have just been silver, silver, silver economy. That would have been the only coins you would have you would have found, just these one dollar silver coins. But the U.S. escaped in 1873 with that coinage act. Meanwhile. These other economies across the world, in Asia, in India, in Latin America, they were those economies were greatly, greatly uh, 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 damaged 
by this by this plunge in the value of silver because they had silver economies. And so essentially the value of their coins was cut in half. All right. The value of their money, of their of their coinage in India, China, Latin America was cut in half. This was a a, a really big detriment to their economies. The US barely escaped, barely escaped. So, Coinage Act of 1873 placed the United States on the gold standard. There's an 1878 $20 double eagle. And this was the coinage, okay? There's that, tw that double eagle, a $10 gold eagle, a $1 gold coin. This is the, the currency. And then for a small change, there was still silver quarters silver dime and then the the copper nickel and the, the copper penny and so you still you still have these this subsidiary coinage but no silver dollars no silver dollars you want any coin above uh, one dollar and above it's got to be gold got to be gold and if you have any debt more than five dollars you can only pay with gold coins so this is a de facto gold standard there it is. U.S. Is, has now joined Europe. Joined Europe. Or so we think. Because within a few years of the Coinage Act of 1873, when, when these silver miners began you know, get, extracting their silver from the American West, and they want to coin their silver into dollars, and they find out, wait, the silver has been demonetized. There's no more silver dollars. It's been discontinued. This sparks a new movement. The free silver movement. And this free sil silver movement, they demand that silver be liberated. That silver dollars, once again, be allowed to, uh, to be minted and to be legal tender. They look at this coin. They see that day, 1872. They want 1878 silver dollars. They want 1880 silver dollars. They want silver dollars to be legal tender for all debts. And this movement builds up, builds up, and, and, and gains a lot of steam in the 1870s and then also later in the 1890s. And so for the next lecture, Lecture 28, now that I laid that groundwork, that introduction, Lecture 28, we're going to look at one of the biggest issues in late 19th century politics, and that is the free silver movement. Not free in the sense of, oh, everybody gets silver for free. Not like that, but in a sense of liberate silver, liberate silver. We'll take a look at that next time for Lecture 28. Looking forward to it. See you there. Bye.